Welcome to Biology 160, Introduction to Anatomy and Physiology. Today we're going to be talking about the muscular system. An interesting fact, just to start out, is the word muscle comes from the word for mouse, interestingly enough. If you look at the first part of muscle, M-U-S, moose, the scientific name for the common house mouse Oop, I forgot a little thing. Is is mus, mus musculus, and so there it is. And so muscle comes from the word for mouse. And I guess because of the way when the muscles contract, it looks like you have a mouse under your skin. I don't know why, but anyway, it's kind of an interesting fact there to think about. Let's start by talking about skeletal muscle function. So back in our first lecture. We listed some of the functions of the skeletal muscle system. And so, so remember when we're talking about the muscular system, we're talking, the muscular system, we're focusing on skeletal muscle. There are three types of muscle tissue in the body that we've already looked at. And we're going to review those here in just a minute. But first of all, let's go over the skeletal muscle functions. So stop the recording and write down as many functions as you can remember from memory, and then we'll review them. Okay, welcome back. Let's see what you came up with. I'm assuming that probably the first one that you came up with is movement. And movement is a very important function of the muscular system, of course. Another in important function is maintaining posture. So our skeletal muscle system keeps us upright. And this is one that we don't often think about, but our, our skeletal muscles are constantly adjusting and moving and, and uh, making sure that we're able to stand upright. Another one is they stabilize joints. And this is especially important when you're talking about joints that don't articulate very well, so such as the the shoulder joint. So um, the, the shoulder, there's a number of bones coming here, but in order to have the extended movement, movement that we have in our shoulder, it doesn't fit into that joint really tightly. And so the muscles around that joint are, are holding that and making sure that our, our joint doesn't uh, dislocate. And then finally, probably the least thought of one, but hopefully you remember this one, is our skeletal muscles generate heat. This is really important. So again, if, you're, if you start to get cold, your body starts to involuntarily start to, sh to shiver. And what's happening there is your, it's causing your skeletal muscles to contract, and that's producing heat. So heat is a byproduct of, of uh, using, using energy in our body. And so just by simply moving our, our muscles... We're using energy, and as we convert that energy, we convert the foods we eat into that energy, that's going to produce a byproduct of heat. And so we use that heat to warm our bodies and maintain a certain temperature in our bodies. So those are the functions of the skeletal system. Now let's go back and review the different types of, of not just skeletal muscle, but the, all three types of, of muscle. So we have three types of muscle in our body. We have skeletal muscle, which we've just talked about briefly. We have cardiac muscle, and we have smooth muscle. And there's similarities and there's differences between each of these types of muscle. They are all different. They all function, function differently. And so we want to take a minute here and look at uh, these different types of muscle. So here's a slide, and on the left I have the three types of muscle listed, and on the right I have a number of words listed to describe the different types of muscles. Some of these words will fit one type of muscle, some of the words will fit another, and some will fit both. So let's review what these words mean, 
and then I'll give you a minute to try to match these, and then we'll go over this. So striated versus non-striated, these go together. Striated means that when you look at the muscle, you can see these lines. It looks like little lines going up and down the height of the muscle, and we call those striations. So some types of muscles have striations, and some do not. Involuntary versus voluntary. Involuntary means that you do not consciously control it, so your body still controls it, but you don't have to think about making the muscle move in order for it to move. Involuntary is opposite, so you're thinking about consciously thinking about moving the muscle. Multinucleated, so cells have nucleus, nuclei, and so some types of muscle cells have multiple nuclei, nuclei and some just have a single nucleus. Branching and intercalated discs. So some types of muscles have branching, and then and then these ones that have branching also have these intercalated discs. And this is where the branching cells meet together. Intercal intercalated discs have uh, passageways through them, so that these branching cells are connected one one to another. So uh, you could start in one cell, and moving through the intercalated discs, you could get to the other cell. And then some cells are long, long, very long cells, and others are spindle shaped. So go ahead and stop this recording for for a few minutes, and go ahead and match these words to the type of skeletal, the type of muscle that they match with. Okay, welcome back. Let's do some matching here. So let's start out with striated. So which types of muscles are striated? There's actually two types that are striated. Skeletal muscle is striated. Cardiac muscle is also striated. Smooth muscle does not have striations. Let's look at voluntary versus involuntary. In this case, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are involuntary. Skeletal muscle is the only one that's voluntary. The only one we, we think about moving. Okay? Multinucleated versus a single nucleus. In this case, there's only one type that is multinucleated, and that is skeletal muscle. Single nucleus is going to be your cardiac muscle and your smooth muscle. And then we have branching. There's only one type of branching cell, and that is the cardiac muscle has branching and has intercalated discs. So cardiac muscle is very important that the muscle all works together in the same at the same time. You want to have these rhythmic motions of, of movement. And so these intercalated discs and the branching, even though you have many cells making up the cardiac muscle, they're able to work together because they're all interconnected. Skeletal muscles are very long cells. These can be some of the longest cells in the body. Up to One cell can be up to as long as one foot long. So if you're thinking about, for example, your thigh muscle, very long, very big muscle, one cell stretches the length of that, that thigh muscle. So it's pretty amazing. It would be very long. And then spindle-shaped spindle, spindle -shaped cells are the smooth muscle. So let's erase this real quick. And let's write down the, the uh, words to, to describe each of these underneath them. So here we are. Here's the, here are the three types of muscle cells now, and it has the words to describe each of these muscle cells written underneath them. We're going to take a little bit of time now and talk a little bit more about these types of muscles. Then we're going to go back in and just focus on the skeletal muscle for the rest of the lecture. Here's a picture of some smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is mainly found in the walls of hollow organs. So, for example, your digestive tract is the walls of the digestive tract have smooth muscle in them. And smooth muscle, their, their job is to help move things along these these organs. And so you can see here in this picture, we have these spindle-shaped cells. So notice how they taper down at the end. And then the other end is going to taper like this, even though you can't see it. And here's your nucleus in the middle, your single nucleus. So you have these spindle-shaped spindle, sh spindle -shaped cells. And when they line the walls of organs, 
you actually have two layers of smooth muscle. And this, these two layers allow the smooth muscle to contract and move things along the length of the organ. So we have what's called a circular layer. So here you can see the circular layer, meaning that the cells wrap around in this direction here. So they circle that organ. So when they, when they contract and shorten, that's going to squeeze the organ. It's going to make this organ thinner, just like squeezing a, a balloon or something like that, or a hot dog or a piece of plate. I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's going to make that, the inside of that organ smaller. Then there's also a lo long, longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. And the longitudinal layer runs this way. So if we were to lengthen this organ out, the longitudinal muscle runs the length of the organ. And so when this contracts, this is going to shorten the organ's length. And again, this can help move things along the length of the organ. So food moving through the digestive tract, you use both of these muscle, t muscle contractions, both the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle, in order to squeeze this organ and move things, move things along. So that's a little bit more about smooth muscle. <clears throat> Cardiac muscle, is an interesting muscle. It's, it has a lot of similarities to, similarities to skeletal muscle because it has striations. The cardio, cardiac muscle is found in bundles and it forms these figure eights around our heart. And so what's happening is this wave of contractions is moving through and as it wraps around the heart, because the muscles wrap around the heart, it's going to squeeze those chambers and force the blood either into the heart or out of the heart and through the body. And we'll talk more about skeletal muscle in its job when we get to uh, the cardiac, cardiovascular system. So let's now focus on skeletal muscle. And so there's a few things here to point out, and then we're going to look at the, the structure of the gross anatomy of the skeletal muscle. So we've already mentioned how skeletal muscles are long, they're elongated. And each muscle cell is also called a muscle fiber. So when you hear somebody talking about muscle fibers, what they're actually talking about are those individual skeletal muscle cells, these very elongated cells. Contraction of muscles, the skeletal muscles, but also the cardiac and smooth muscle is a result of microfilaments. And microfilaments these are proteins that are packed inside the muscle. This is also what gives the muscle its striations in the case of skeletal and cardiac muscle. And even though there are no striations in the smooth muscle, there are still microfilaments that are causing this, this contraction to happen. So proteins inside the muscle is what causes contractions to happen. Then as far as learning the terms of muscles, there's a few prefix, prefixes that if you know, whenever you see them, you'll know that it's, being, it's referring to the muscles. So MYO, MYO, and MYS always refer to muscle. And we'll see some examples of that just coming up in a minute. But then also the prefix SARCO, S-A-R-C-O, refers to flesh, but this is also referring to muscle. So if anything that's called SARCO, for example, inside the muscle cells, the endoplasmic reticulum, which is found in most all cells, has a special name. They don't just call it the endoplasmic reticulum, they call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Those sarco referring to the muscle cells. So let's look at the anatomy of the skeletal muscle. So there's some, there's important, some important terms I want you to know from this here. <clears throat> let's first point out the muscle fiber. So here we're looking at a muscle fiber. So one muscle fiber, again, remember this is a, a muscle cell. So here we're looking at a, the very smallest part of this tissue, of this organ that still makes it this, this organ. So this is the, the skeletal muscle tissue. This is one cell. Notice how these cells come in bundles. So you have bundles of these muscle fibers all packed together and then you have many packs of fibers within just this one muscle. So, 
these muscle fibers, all around the muscle fibers, we have something called endomysium. So point out the what this word means if you look at the MYS. We just learned that that's a prefix referring to muscles. So we know that endomysium is referring to muscles, and then the the first part of the word endo means in. So this is the the inner uh, part of the muscle. Endomysium is a connective tissue, and its job is to hold all the muscle fibers together. So within this bundle of muscle fibers, all around these muscle fibers, you have endomysium. And this endomysium, again, is holding these bundles together. This bundle of muscle fibers we call a fascicle. So in here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fascicles made up of these bundles of muscle fibers. And the fascicle is wrapped by something called paramecium. Again, notice the MYS, meaning muscle. And paramecium is found in between. So this is, this is the middle ty type of connective tissue, and it holds together the fascicles. So we have endomecium around the muscle fibers. We have paramecium around the fascicles. And then finally, we have something called epimecium. MYS telling us it's the muscle. And then ep epi, E-P-I, this means the outside. And we'll see this uh, prefix in a number of places as well throughout this semester. So endo is in the inside, epi is on the outside, and the para is in between. Again, all three are the connective tissues. So here you can see the, it's pointing to the, the epimecium. So your one muscle, so if you were to take, for example, your bicep and chop it in half, this is what you'd see. So the first layer you'd cut through would be the epimecium, and then you'd cut into the fascicles, which are wrapped by this paramecium, and then finally you'd get into the muscle cells, these muscle fibers, and the endomecium that is surrounding them. Notice here that at the end of the muscle, we have a tendon. So the epimecium is continuous with the tendon. So the muscle cells actually end here. So muscle tissue is different than the tissue that makes up tendons. Remember, the tendons are made up of dense connective tissue. So here at the end of the muscle, we have this dense connective tissue coming in, and that's going to attach the muscle to the bone. So that is the gross anatomy of the skeletal muscles. So uh, just mention a little bit more about tendons. So tendons are collagen, mostly collagen fibers, and this is a, a strong fiber that's that does not have a lot of lot of give, and so these tendons are holding those muscles in place. Tendons often also cross joints. Something to realize about skeletal muscle tissue: the cells themselves are not actually very strong, so you can cut through muscle very easily. It's not there's it's not a very uh, necessarily durable tissue, but at the same time, it is it is very strong. So when it's contracting, there's a lot of strength there. But the muscle cell itself is not that strong. Tendons, on the other hand, are very strong. So muscles have to move across joints because in order to move that joint, you have to, you have to be on both sides of that joint. But the muscle fibers themselves the muscle tissue doesn't cross the joint. That's the job of the tendons. Tendons are a lot, a lot uh, uh, harder to break. They're they're not going to have the wear and tear that the muscles do. And so, because of their toughness, they're the ones that cross that joint. There's also something called aponeuroses, and this is a sheet-like structure, and this attaches the muscles indirectly to bones, cartilages, and sometimes other connective tissue coverings. So this is how a muscle, this is a little bit about the gross anatomy of the muscle, how it's attached to the, the bones, and, and its job in the, the muscular system. In the next part of the lecture, we're going to get into the microscopic anatomy of the muscles and really see how they contract, and then also how they're controlled by the nervous system. Thank you.